This algebraic geometry video will be about Hurwitz curves. These are the most symmetric curves um, of given genus. Let's call the genus G. So um, G equals naught. The only curve is the projective line and the group is infinite. So there's nothing very interesting to say. If G equals one, this is an elliptic curve. And again, the group of automorphisms is infinite. Um, the curve is actually has a group structure. So you can just take translations by the group. Um, so what we want to do is to talk about the case G greater than one. And here, Hurwitz proved that the order of the automorphism group is at most 84 times g minus 1. This is if the characteristic is equal to 0. As we will see a bit later, if the characteristic is p, you can actually exceed this bound. So um, um, we're going to sketch a proof of this. And the idea of the proof is to look at the orbifold Euler characteristic. Um, so you remember, if you've got a surface, then the Euler characteristic, usually denoted by chi, is equal to um, n2 minus n1 plus n0, where ni is the number of, of um, um, cells of dimension i in some suitable cellular decomposition. Um, so for, for example, the sphere has Euler characteristic two and the um, torus has Euler characteristic zero. And in general, the Euler characteristic for a compact sur orientable surface is equal to two minus two G. So this is compact orientable. Um, well, orbifolds are given by are given by a, a quotient of a surface by some sort of finite group. At least they are in this uh, particular lecture. Um, more generally, orbifolds can be more complicated. And the idea is you have something called an orbifold Euler characteristic. Um, the point is, if you've got a point fixed by the subgroup H, then the quotient of this point by the group H should be thought of as only 1 over H of a point. So the point divided by the subgroup H counts as 1 over H of a point. So this is a funny way of counting points. You sometimes count a point as being only a, it's really only a fraction of a point. So a simple example of this, suppose we've got a, a disc and we uh, take an automorphism of order two that just takes, rotates by 180 degrees. And if we quotient out by this, you know, Im imagine you get a piece of paper and cut it in half and then glue these two ends together. You can see you really get a sort of cone where this point here corresponds to this point here. And this point counts as only half a point um, when you're trying to work out the Euler characteristic. Um, the key point of this is that if you've got a surface S, then the Euler characteristic of S modulo a group G, where G is going to be a finite group acting nicely on it, is equal to the Euler characteristic of S divided by the order of G. It's not too difficult to check this. Um, now, um, if you've got a surface quotient out by group G, you can consider it as an orbifold. You can also just consider it as, as a surface again, provided the group action is reasonably nice. So, um, this will have two Euler characteristics. It's got a sort of topological Euler characteristic if you consider it as being a surface. 
and it's got an orbifold Euler characteristic. So the difference is the topological Euler characteristic, you count this as one point, and the orbifold Euler characteristic, you only count it as half a point. So suppose the um, orbifold S over G, uh, suppose you think of this as being a surface um, T with some conical singular points. Um, where you've quoted up by a group of order orders p1, p2, p3, and so on. So what you can do is you can think of this quotient as being something like an ordinary surface. It might be something like a torus. But then on the torus, there are going to be some uh, a finite number of points that sort of look a bit like cones, like that. So you might have some strange conical singularity sticking out of your torus. And then the orbifold Euler characteristic is equal to the topological Euler characteristic minus 1 minus 1 over P1 minus 1 minus 1 over P2 and so on. Because and to get from the orbifold Euler characteristic, the topological one, we're removing honest topological points of Euler characteristic one and replacing them by these funny conical points of Euler characteristic one over P. So um, what we want to show is the maximum value of this is um, minus one over 42. So where does this funny number 1 over 42 comes from? Well, um, the topological Euler characteristic is going to be 2 minus 2h for some h, where h is the genus of the topological surface. And each of these numbers, 1 minus 1 over p, will be a half, 2 thirds, 3 quarters, 4 fifths, and so on, depending on what p is. So, um, so uh, this um, has to be a negative number, and we want it to be as close to zero as possible. So what are the possibilities? Um, well, first of all, h equals zero, because um, if, um, if h... If h is greater than zero, then we've got a factor of 2 minus 2h minus 1 minus 1 over p1 and so on. And this is going to be either zero, which isn't allowed, or it's going to be less than or equal to minus a half, because this is minus a half. So we know the orbifold must be a sphere with Euler characteristic zero with some of these funny conical points. Um, suppose there are at most two conical points, pi, so we've got p1 and p2. Then the um, orbifold Euler characteristic is going to be 2 minus 1 minus 1 over p1 minus 1 minus 1 over p2, and this will be greater than 0. So this case isn't allowed. Um, suppose there are at least four conical points. Then the Euler char characteristic is going to be 2 minus 1 minus 1 over p1 up to minus 1 minus 1 over p4 and so on. And each of these numbers is a half or two thirds or three quarters and so on. So you can see that this uh, since it's negative, must be at most, must be less than or equal to minus a sixth. So minus a sixth comes when you take these numbers to be a half, a half, a half, and two thirds. If they're all a half, then this would be zero, which isn't possible. And minus a sixth is less than minus one over 42. So we, we don't allow this case either. So we see that there are um, exactly three conical points. P1, P2, and P3. 
So now we examine the possibilities for what P1, P2, and P3 can be. Suppose there are two conical points. Um, Uh, sorry, suppose there are no conical points of order two. Then what are the possibilities? We could have three, three, three. Well, that, 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 that's no good because that gives Euler characteristic um, uh, two minus two thirds minus two thirds minus two thirds, which is equal to zero. The next case would be three, three, four which gives us two minus two thirds minus two thirds minus three quarters, which is equal to minus a twelfth. And you can see that this is the, um, if we take three, three, anything else, or any numbers other than three, then the number is going to be even smaller than minus a twelfth. So minus a twelfth is less than minus one over 42. So um, that case is okay. So, so we can't have zero conical points of order two. So there's at least one um, point of order two. So our points of orders two, P2, and P3. Um, if there are two points of order two, then what do we get? The Euler characteristic is going to be two minus um, a half minus a half minus um, one minus one over P3. And this is greater than zero. So that's not possible. So there is exactly one point of <coughs> order two. So our numbers are two, P2, P3, where these are greater than or equal to three, and that's greater than or equal to three. Um, if neither is order three, so let's look at the case um, where P2, P3 are greater than or equal to four. Well, then we've got one possibility is the points of orders two, four, four. Well, this gives an Euler characteristic of two minus a half minus three quarters minus three quarters equals naught, which isn't possible. The next case is two, four, five, which gives an Euler characteristic of two minus a half minus three quarters minus four fifths, which is equal to minus one over 20. And this is less than minus one over 42. And two, um, anything bigger than four and five will be will be even worse than this. So we can't have both points having order greater than or equal to four. So we can assume that P1 is of order two, P2 is of order three. Um, and the P3 is at least three. Now we look at the possibilities for P3. So suppose P3 is equal to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. And what is the Euler characteristic? 2 minus um, 1 minus 1 over P1 minus 1 minus 1 over P2 minus 1 minus 1 over P3. So you remember P1 is equal to a half and P2, sorry, P1 is equal to 2 and P2 equals 3. Well, the possibilities for P3 equals 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You can work these out there. 1 sixth, 1 twelfth, 1 thirtieth, 0, minus 1 over 42, minus 1 over 24, and so on. So that comes with 8. And these cases are not allowed because the Euler characteristic has to be negative. So we see that the largest possible value is minus 1 over 42. So in other words, the Euler characteristic, if the orbifold Euler characteristic is less than naught, then it's less than, it's less than root to minus one over 42. And we've also seen the next best case is minus one over 24. So if the Euler characteristic is not equal to 
minus 1 over 42, the Euler characteristic is less than or equal to minus 1 over 24. So we'll use that a little bit later. So, so the Euler characteristic, which is 2 minus 2g over the order of g, is less than or equal to minus 1 over 42 if it's less than 0. So there are lots of cases when it can be zero or positive, which correspond to um, groups acting on surfaces of genus one or zero. But if it acts on a surface of genus at least two, then we get this bound here. And this just says that the order of G is less than or equal to um, 84 times G minus one, which is the Hurwitz bound. Moreover, if this bound is satisfied, then G must be a qu quotient of the orbifold fundamental group. Um, so this implies G is generated by elements alpha, beta, gamma, with alpha squared equals 1, beta cubed equals 1, gamma to 7 equals 1, alpha, beta, gamma equals 1. So um, a finite group generated by three elements with these properties is called a Hurwitz group. Um, so it's a, um, and it's, you can also show that if you've got a finite group generated by three elements with these properties, then it is in fact, um, comes from um, a Hurwitz surface. So this gives you the problem of finding all finite groups which are generated by elements of order two and three whose product has order seven. Um, so in the next video, we will give some examples of Hurwitz curves and Hurwitz groups.